Hello and welcome to this video on how to conduct an Office 365 training. Uh, my name is Gabriel, I work at Tech Impact, and I'm a SharePoint Implementation Specialist. I've moved probably about 150 different organizations to SharePoint. Um, this is typically involves working with them to design an environment in SharePoint, training them, and then migrating their files over. So for this training, we're going to talk about um, kind of the important things that are needed when conducting an end user training. Uh, mainly kind of the things you want to think about with regards to how you want to frame your information and then other more specific components such as things you should definitely talk about in an end user training. So let's start with um, talking about the audience. So it's really important to first just know your audience and understand who you are speaking to. Uh, mainly because there are going to be some specific features that people are going to, to either want to know about or certain ways of doing things that might be easier given your audience, whether those are Excel power users, uh, people who send a lot of files via email, or users that manage events and information for events. So really just know what feature set you want to bring to the table for the different users that will be attending your training. And sometimes you'll have this split up for different types of users, you'll have different, uh, different separate meetings involved in the training process, and you'll talk about different things in each respective training. Now, Audience aside, we do recommend conducting two different uh, trainings for any given set of users. Uh, more specifically, we recommend doing a demo of the environment first and then do a more in-depth training. Now for us, that involves uh, a demo that covers all of the Office 365 components. So OneDrive, Skype for Business, Yammer, and then SharePoint. And sometimes we'll even go over some of the email and calendar functionality if they're not familiar with that environment. And this also involves uh, navigating between them. So the app drawer is a big part of that conversation and how to use the app drawer, such as pinning different apps up here to the top navigation. So in talking about OneDrive, we basically show them the sync, uh, we show them the web, we try and talk about OneDrive objectively, and by that I mean it's very confusing for a lot of users to understand the distinction between OneDrive and SharePoint. OneDrive being for personal files, SharePoint being for collaborative use. So really try and talk about them in contrast to each other. So people understand that OneDrive is really just for personal files and that if you have an item that's meant to be shared, ideally there's a place for it in SharePoint. So keep that distinction, uh, make that very apparent. For Skype for Business, we introduce uh, the web component to it. So the fact that you can sign in here to the IM when it's working. Uh, I don't maybe have to, I think I have to be actually in mail or calendar of people for it to sign me in. Uh, but if the IM component in online in the Outlook Web Access, the local program, as well as the remote plugin that people who are maybe attending a Skype for Business meeting that you've coordinated can use to join your meeting. Uh, for Yammer, we try and address the most popular uses, which would be uh, networks both internally and externally. So we try and highlight how the internal network is just for people on, on your domain's website and how the external networks can be used to interface with people outside of your organization. These are just things you want to highlight when going through this process. And of course SharePoint. So in the end user demo we talk about SharePoint just enough so that people feel comfortable with the environment. And that's why we go through these other apps and so they understand the context in which SharePoint exists in Office 365. And here's that instant message component that I mentioned earlier. So when we talk about SharePoint, we find that it's most useful to um, just talk about the way things are laid out. Talk about this landing page when you go to the Sites tab and how it's function. This or the organization that you're training may or may not be utilizing uh, this Sites landing page, which should be loading. There it is. Uh, we happen to be using our site's landing page. The organization you're training may not. So this may just be something that you know is a temporary convenience um, to get them to where they want to go, such as your main SharePoint site. So once we're here, we encourage you to just talk about the basic layout and also recommend bookmarking and really encouraging people to bookmark so that when they get here, they can bookmark this, this page so they don't have to go through all of the other steps to get to this main home page. So in SharePoint, the things you definitely want to focus on are the top navigation, 
more specifically how it remains consistent, the left navigation and how it changes from site to site, the actual site navigation, so how you can go through the different sites here and um, click on a different site and go to another site, um, and then document libraries. So it's really important for people to understand document libraries because they're already familiar with the idea of saving files in a server environment or in a special folder uh, such as a Dropbox folder or a Google Drive folder. So the document library is really what's going to help this click for the end user. Once they understand what a document library is, it becomes much more easy for them, easier for them to kind of adapt this environment a little bit better. So I'm going to go to one of our sites called Cloud Services. And I'm going to go to a document library, more specifically cloud documents. So the things you want to cover here are just uploading a document and opening a file, a Word document collaboratively. That's it. Uh, just because it's enough for people to understand, okay, files go here, here's some folders, maybe go through some of the subfolders if, if it's a live environment. If it's pre-migration, then maybe you want to create a folder and add a file to it just to have something to show them, hey, Here's the file in this environment. And using Word collaboratively through the Word Online web app is really, really useful as well because it shows them some functionality that they may have never thought about. Um, the real-time collaborative editing that you get through Word Online is new, it's exciting, it gets them to start to get excited for the next training where you're going to go much more in-depth in SharePoint. So that's pretty much all we cover in our first end user demo, which is the first training that we have with end users to get them familiar with the environment and also get them excited about the environment. The next training is the end user training. And this is really going into the everyday tasks of SharePoint. So we have a list of items that we feel cover about 90% of the use cases, use cases for file storage in SharePoint on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so the way that we found this works best um, is to first introduce interacting with files. So we, we lay out three different ways of working with files. The first is through the online, um, through the online app. So for instance, let's create a new Word document. And you know this is really more of a um, kind of a novelty feature and the collaborative editing uh, component is really, really great. But honestly, not a lot of users, well, there are some that would prefer to use the web app, but there's really a limited functionality of the web app. Maybe about 25% of the functionality of Word you can accomplish through the Word Online web app. So a lot of the day-to-day -day -day interactions with files is going to be through your local running Office programs. So the first way we, the first kind of paradigm or modality or mode of interacting with files would be browsing for the file through the web and handing it off to your local running Word, whether it's through previewing the document first and opening it locally, or bypassing it and going directly to your local running program. So this is the first mode, finding the file in the web and then handing it off to your local running programs. The second method would be going directly to your Word program. So if I was to minimize the browser altogether and just open up Word 2013, and I was to browse. So if I go to uh, open other documents, and let's see, let's find, let's find here uh, OneDrive or Tech Impact, not OneDrive, I'm sorry, Site Stash Tech Impact. So here I can browse all the different files that are on um, my, my SharePoint environment. So I can go to Cloud Documents, and I can go and browse the files. That's not what I wanted. I wanted, oh, that's because I picked a history file. We get a Cloud Documents. All right, so here I'm going to find all of uh, those folders we saw on the web and that Word document. So this is the second way of interacting with files, going straight to the Word program and opening up the file from there. And it's really important to make this distinction because you're going to have a different variety of users who feel more comfortable in the web or more comfortable in their local running Word. For the last set of users, which I don't know if I signed in properly for this, but I will try it, you have the Open with Explorer method. And that's a way to interact with your files that are here in SharePoint right through your local running file browser. And this is important because you have a lot of users that really, really don't like change and you want to make sure that for those users or for users that maybe have to attach files to email and then if they're not using the um, 
latest version or the 2016 version of Office, uh, they're going to have to find a way to attach files to email. And this open with Explorer method is the way to do that. So these are three different methods or modes of interacting with files that are really important to convey so that all the different types of users feel comfortable with interacting with files. I have three different ways to do it. After that, we introduce the SharePoint specific features. So versioning, checking items in and out. Uh, these are really new features that are super, super useful and really um, alleviate anxiety about what happens if they overwrite something or how can I keep people from modifying something while I'm working on it. Really, really important things to consider um, when trying to make people feel comfortable with this environment. Other features to cover would be the search, whether that's the search inside of the document library or the site level search up here, which gives you a little more information. So it looks more like a Bing or a Google search. We have some snippet of information. You can then filter the information, whereas this is a very quick type of search here. Another thing to talk about after views are sorry, after searches are views. So views um, are really, really useful because they give users that everyday um, filtering ability. So when they know that they're always looking for the same types of files, they can use views to get that information easily. So views are definitely something you want to introduce everyone. Then we have the recycle bin. Now the recycle bin, I'm going to spend a little more time on this because you have to remember that when dealing with users, you also have to deal with the admins, or at least keep them in mind. So the recycle bin in SharePoint has been set up so that when you delete something from a site, it goes to that site's recycle bin, and only the user who deleted that item can see it. Um, and that, that's a concern. It's a very valid concern because that means that if someone else deletes a file in a, in a document library, it's just gone. For all intents and purposes, for a user who didn't delete it, they just won't see it anymore. They go to the recycle bin, they won't see it. So to alleviate this, this very pressing and very real issue, we recommend talking about alerts. More specifically, the alert that lets you be notified when an item is deleted for a document library. So when training people on the recycle bin, you talk about it, uh, you talk about that very, very valid concern, and then you walk them through how to create an alert so that when someone else deletes an item, you can get be notified immediately on a daily summary or weekly summary, just so that you have that audit trail in your email of when things have been deleted, which is really, really useful. Now, anxiety aside, uh, at least that kind of anxiety where you know something went missing, uh, there's a whole another kind of layer to how the recycling bin works and how you might want to train people in using the recycle bin. So the recycle bin has um, a user end user component where the end user can see files that they have sent to the recycle bin within a given site. An administrator in SharePoint can see all of the files across all of the sites. And when the end user deletes something, it goes to the recycle bin. But then when they delete it from the recycle bin, it technically goes to a second stage recycle bin that only the administrator can see. Now this is something that we don't usually tell the end user. Instead we tell them, which is a true statement, if you leave an item in the recycle bin for 93 days, it will be permanently deleted after 93 days. And that's true. So we recommend that they just let it sit there for 93 days and not have to worry about it. Because after then it's gone for good. And this is important because if they knew that they could just delete it and then get an admin to restore it, they're not going to think twice about deleting it permanently. We'll send it to the second stage recycle bin more specifically. But it really puts the onus on them to own to, to know that they should keep something for 93 days just in case they need it, need it. So they're not bothering someone else to get that information, but owning the responsibility of having it available. So that's the best way that we uh, recommend training end users on the recycle bin. Knowing that, you know, not really telling them that if they have a catch-all if it is deleted, but rather letting them, telling them to let it sit there for 93 days. Outside of those basic functions, there's some everyday tasks we try and cover and make sure that it's important for people to know how to do. So for example, emailing files, um, whether that's through a link, which is important to understand is a huge paradigm shift for most users where they're previously sending emails, attachments with files, they will now be sending links to files. And with, in, con in conjunction with versioning, this makes a really great audit trail and the ability to see all the different changes of a document as it gets you know, worked on by different users in an organization. And then bookmarking items. So I mentioned earlier when we first logged in, it was important to bookmark. Um, it's important to also remind end users that everything they see is a bookmark. 
whether it's a folder, a file, a site, an app, a document library, all of those items can be bookmarked uh, for easy access in the future. That's really all there is to talk about in the everyday tasks training in SharePoint. We've, we, like I said, we have had about 90% of the functionality fall under the umbrella of those topics I just mentioned. Uh, unless, of course, they're doing more advanced functionality, but my primary focus is really getting people's files up in SharePoint. Uh, of course, more advanced metadata, uh, record sets, uh, other types of uh, document sets, other types of implementations will, of course, involve much more in-depth process, but this is this covers most of what an everyday file user would use in the SharePoint environment. The last thing I'll mention is about scheduling. So we found that uh, typically, well, in our, with our, in our implementations, end user trainings usually revolve around the migrations themselves. Uh, this means that we found that it works best when possible and when the group's not too large to do the demo before the migration to introduce everyone to the environment in an empty, uh, kind of like a scaffold because the, the sites are there, the document libraries are there, but there are no files. So we, we introduce it in that environment, introduce users to that environment, then migrate maybe two days later, so we'll do the demo on a Wednesday, migrate on the Friday over the weekend, and then Monday morning have the end user training in the live environment with their live files first thing in the morning. That way users are immersed in the environment and are actually using it right after the training. It's really crucial, the zero latency between the training and the application of the training. And whenever possible, you want to record the meetings. So if there are too many users, uh, you probably can't do this uh, before the training and after, or before the migration, do the demo, and the after the migration, do the training. Um, so you're probably going to, do, going to want to do both trainings, the demo and the training, before the migration, record them both, and make them available for everyone so that they can have that information beforehand, see it, and then come Monday morning, they could use it as a reference. And if you have the opportunity, you could even break down that video into smaller chunks so people can kind of get to what they need to do um, and compartmentalize it in that way. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, we've based this system on years of uh, trainings and found you know what works best, uh, taking feedback into account into this process. Uh, so we hope it will help you out. Thank you for your time.